And uh, I'll now turn the floor over to Professor Sagar Kare, who is a uh, uh, member of the, the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine and also uh, of the um, Chemistry and Chemical Biology Department here on the, the Bush campus and also a member of the Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Uh, Sagar serves as the uh, graduate director for the Institute for Quantitative Biomedicine uh, PhD program. Uh, and uh, we've um, been working very closely with him over the last couple of years, exploring uh, aspects of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, you'll hear more from him now. Sagar, the floor is yours. Your, your slides are visible. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so uh, let's see, can you, um, can you hear me? We can hear you, we can see your slides. You're good to go. Okay, all right, excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, so let me tell you a little bit about how we're using um, AlphaFold uh, in order to perform predictions that are related to uh, understanding uh, what is happening with SARS-CoV-2. So uh, some of the questions that, that uh, you know, we think about uh, in my group and in collaboration with, uh, with Stephen um, and others is uh, about the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 proteome, right? So SARS-CoV-2 has, has 30 proteins and um, you can think of this as a, as a large sort of, you know, evolutionary, many, many evolutionary trajectories that we have access to because of um, uh, the, the sequencing efforts uh, and the public availability of both structures and sequences. So, so this is a fantastic data set in some sense, uh, although unfortunate that it is so, but uh, that we have uh, on, on these sequence structure relationships. And so the idea, uh, the, the main questions that we have been asking is how have these viral proteins changed uh, and the proteome changed on the whole? Um, what are the molecular bases and structural bases for changes in these proteins that we have observed? And in particular, uh, the question on everyone's mind uh, today is what is happening with the Omicron variant? And I'll tell you a little bit about the work that, um, you know, we have been uh, really cranking out in the last two weeks with a, with a fantastic team. Um, and uh, the second question, which was my original uh, title, was to think about how we can be prepared for the next pandemic. So as all of you know, uh, several promising antiviral moieties have been developed or are in the pipeline and are showing great promise. For example, the Pfizer molecule against the main protease. Um, and the question is, because we know that there is going to be a next pandemic, it's really just a question of when, not if. Um, the question that we have to ask is, you know, are they going to work against the next coronavirus pandemic strain. So we're using structure prediction software to look at the diversity of these drug targets and, and uh, hopefully in, in the studies to come, try and characterize these targets and, and uh, perhaps develop these molecules to be broad range coronaviral inhibitors as measures for pandemic preparedness. Okay, so let's first talk about the second question. Um, and, um, you know, I was recently surprised to learn that zoonotic spillovers of coronaviruses and recombination between coronaviruses in animals as well as in humans is, is much more common than we think, right? And so, um, you know, now that, that we are in a pandemic, people have been looking at other coronaviruses. And, um, you know, the picture that is emerging is that these coronaviruses are constantly jumping the species barrier. So if you... Um, look here, this region is just for one species of bats. Uh, these are, are hotspots of um, interspecies transmission into humans from bats in Southeast Asia. And, you know, this is only one region that we know of. Um, there are other regions, including Hawaii and, and in Malaysia, for example, uh, people saw that coronaviruses from, uh, you know, canines and feline species uh, were infecting humans. But of course, they don't cause pandemics. It's that rare event that endows these viruses through um, evolution and natural selection with the ability to become transmissible and, and virulent and, and that causes a pandemic. So in order for us to be prepared, we really have to think about the diversity of coronaviruses in a diverse set of species around the world. And um, you know, the drug targets um, are, are really going to change, right? And so what we want to do is to prepare for a broad diversity 
of the most conserved drug, drug target, right? And so what I mean by that, I'll, I'll explain in a minute. Um, but suffice it to say that there are many coronaviruses which are constantly recombining. And you can see this, uh, you know, cladogram of just human uh, coronaviruses of which there are many. And so we really have to think and be more broadly prepared. Okay, so um, what about this MPRO or, or main protease, right? Um, so if you look at the coronavirus sequence, you can see that there are two proteases uh, that process the, um, the polyprotein that is encoded by the RNA genome into individual fragment proteins. And these individual fragment proteins then come together and lead to viral maturation. And these two proteases are NSP3 and NSP5, of which NSP5 is the more important or, or perhaps the, the more um, the one that uh, cleaves at many more sites, I shouldn't say it's more important, um, but it cleaves at many, many more sites. And because it has to recognize all these sites, uh, you can imagine that its active site has to be, you know, has, has far more pressure to maintain its identity. So in that sense, it's much more likely to be conserved than, for example, the spike protein, you know, which is uh, constantly changing as, as we see. Um, and, and to buttress that point, um, you know, you, if you look at the sequence of the original, you know, OG SARS-CoV and compare that to SARS-CoV-2, you will see that they, they are nearly identical. And in fact, if you superimpose their active sites, they are 100% identical, right? Nonetheless, um, these proteases are different across species, right? And, and so the question is, uh, what is their diversity? And then can we use that and understand that diversity and once we understand that diversity, uh, what can we say about uh, the likelihood of drugs uh, acting against the next pandemic, right? So structure-based efforts have led to the development of drugs. This is uh, the Pfizer compound that is docked into the uh, active site. This is a crystal structure, uh, you know, and, and they reported this in a recent science paper. So this is, uh, this is excellent news. Um, and so what we did over this summer, um, you know, in collaboration with a number of undergraduate students in the RICE program was to broadly look at the diversity of main protease sequences from all kinds of coronaviruses, right? So we constructed this large cladogram and then identified uh, representative examples, right? So if you just look at the sequence alignment, right? And then use a structure-based alignment based on the current knowledge of SARS-CoV-1 uh, and 2 sequences, um, you can obtain these types of cladograms, but you can also obtain alignments which are based on the active site, right? So using these structures, um, we aligned all of these sequences and then used um, alpha fold on uh, tens of these sequences to obtain structure-based models, right? And so here you can see that alpha fold modeled protein structures are similar to the crystal structures of SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, which would be expected. However, there are details in the active site that are quite different, right? And so the question is, um, how, does this, uh, how do these differences affect their functions? And so we're uh, planning to investigate this both in the wet lab as well as um, computationally. Um, and, uh, but what we can see already is that we can cluster these sequences, right? Um, you know, so we can do a traditional clustering of sequences, but on the other hand, we can also do clustering based on these three-dimensional structures, right? So now we have a large instead of a multiple sequence alignment, now we have a multiple structure alignment and we can start observing these diversities. So because of the ready availability of you know, high quality models, we can um, you know, really get an understanding of how this family is changing and what we can do about these changes, right? Um, so if you look at um, this diversity now, now in terms of structure, you can see that in the middle, you have this, this Pfizer compound and we have highlighted all the points where you have uh, different amino acid changes, right? So the idea is that this point is going to be, you know, A, G, N, P, S, all different amino acids. And perhaps that may lead in some cases um, to differences in, in binding of this drug, right? So, so these analyses are ongoing, uh, but we're very excited to, to see that um, these things can, can happen, um, are now possible. Um, and then finally, let me just quickly tell you um, in the last few minutes about, um, uh, what is happening with Omicron. Um, so, you know, I'm sure for those of you who are uh, not living under a rock, your, um, your, your knowledge of the Greek alphabet has, has dramatically increased these days. And we are confronted now in the pandemic with uh, a new variant called the Omicron variant, right? So what do we know about this? This is heavily substituted, uh, meaning there are lots of amino acid changes compared to other variants of concern. 
a total of 50, I think, or so with insertions and deletions. And about 30 of these are in a single protein of the virus, which is the spike protein that you can see in, um, in red over here, right? So, um, um, so the spike protein has 30 mutations and of these 30 or so mutations, 15 of them are in a single part of the protein called the receptor binding domain. And the receptor binding domain is the part that is responsible for engaging the ACE2 receptor, which the virus uses to gain entry inside cells. So clearly something is going on with, um, you know, with this receptor binding. Um, the second thing that we know is that many of these substitutions are individually known to evade neutralizing antibodies, right? And many of them are known to increase ACE2 binding. So the question is, um, what happens when all of these substitutions occur together, right? So there are two possibilities. Well, there are three possibilities, right? One is that they keep doing their own thing, um, but that seems less likely because they are all so close to one another. Um, but the other po two possibilities are that they help each other or they hurt each other in terms of their functions. So this is in, in more fancy terms, this is epistasis um, for geneticists or, or cooperativity for biochemists, right? So the idea is, what can, what can we say about what these mutations are going to do together? Now, remember, this is an inherently three-dimensional problem, right? Uh, this, this spike protein, the receptor binding domain has a particular shape that gets changed upon substitutions, and that's going to lead to changes in its behavior. So what, so, um, you know, given, as Stephen mentioned in his talk, there are hundreds of structures of, um, these spike proteins bound to various entities in the protein data bank. So we decided to take advantage of, of this and um, uh, started to construct models of this Omicron RBD, bind, RBD or receptor binding domain in complex with not only ACE2, but a variety, hundreds of different antibodies. And then we're analyzing these um, complexes to see what we can say about uh, these interfaces, uh, at least in qualitative terms. Um, so you can imagine that, you know, um, you know, pre alpha fold to a Rosetta fold, you could, you, the, the, what you would do, and which is what we did was, you know, you start from a PDB structure, you perform a kind of relax using, this is a Rosetta is a, is a force field that we're using or energy function. And then we perform all the substitutions that correspond to the Omicron um, variant because no structures of Omicron are currently available. It just, you know, it takes a little time. And then we create this model, right? Um, on the other hand, now what we can do is we can make um, an alpha fold prediction of the Omicron receptor binding domain or, or certainly of, of other domains as well. And then we use this to superimpose into the PDB structures of the complexes with antibodies, for example. And then we can perform um, you know, more minimization to obtain another view or another possibility for this Omicron complex, right? A third possibility, of course, would be that, um, you know, we would take just uh, Omicron and the antibody sequence that it binds and, and obtain this model, right? But as we have heard many times, this is not, you know, this is not going to work because, um, you know, there, there is no uh, co-evolution signal between Omicron and FAB sequence. And indeed, when we tried to do that initially, we always find that we get the individual components correct, but their relative orientation is not predicted because AlphaFold doesn't know how to do that indeed. Um, but anyway, it was interesting to see that uh, it's able to get these individual components correctly. So if you look at AlphaFold predictions versus, you know, what's in the crystal structure, you can see it, it gets pretty, uh, AlphaFold gets pretty close to um, the, vi the wild type or the Wuhan HU1 strain RBD, which is as expected. Uh, there isn't going to be that much of a change. Um, and, you know, here is, are these two molecules overlaid on one another, uh, and they look pretty close. However, if you look at the quality metrics from, from AlphaFold 2, so this is sort of the, the technical point that I want to bring up, is that, you know, it's really important, I think, to look at these quality metrics from AlphaFold. So, for example, for this Omicron RBD, you know, the part that really binds um, uh, this ACE2 receptor and is the recognition site of a particular class called class 1 uh, antibodies is really excellent, you know, has high PLDDT scores, meaning high quality. However, there is a part here, uh, you know, towards the side, which is also where several antibodies bind, and that is a low quality prediction, right? And, and that is because there is a mutation to a proline um, and, you know, this, this weird alpha helix um, uh, structure is being formed. So I think we have to be cautious in interpreting anything uh, that we can conclude by looking at these parts. Um, so going on, uh, you know, we compared what alpha fold 
models tell us about how ACE2 is going to be recognized. And we saw something which I think is really cool, right? So if you, uh, if you look at the wild type model, you will see how ACE2 receptor is being recognized by a couple of you know, polar contacts, hydrogen bonds between um, ACE2 polar residues and a couple of um, uh, you know, RBD residues. Compare that to what is happening in Omicron, and you will see that there is this, you know, um, really interdigitated uh, set of interactions, side chains that are making hydrogen bonds with backbones, other side chains, and are interdigitating with the side chains from ACE2, suggesting a much more, you know, native protein like, you know, this, if you were to ask me, um, as a protein designer, I would say that, you know, this network looks much more like the product of evolution. So clearly, uh, or, or certainly, uh, it seems like uh, this network has evolved, uh, you know, in order to, to uh, have certain advantages. And that is reflected in the, the DN by DS ratios of the Omicron variant. But anyway, we can, we can um, get into that later. So, so clearly, this tells us this type of structural modeling um, gives us hypotheses for how this recognition is happening and, and um, a new network of interactions is being formed, right? Uh, on the other hand, all the antibodies that we have looked at, we can see that several interactions uh, have been disrupted in the antibodies. And therefore, um, you know, that was already known that individually these interactions are, are affected, but we did not, or we have seen little evidence for any compensatory interactions or mutations that are likely to uh, have as strong of a, um, uh, you know, interaction network with the antibody as before. So overall, uh, it seems that, um, these Omicron mutations increase um, or, or make um, uh, ACE2 binding uh, quite, quite a bit more robust and antibodies, uh, unfortunately, seems like uh, are going to take a hit, right? So uh, just to summarize, I told you about um, two stories in which we are using protein structure prediction. Um, these are the people who are doing it, most prominently Joey Lubin from my lab, who has been doing fantastic work in, um, in working with our collaborators, um, Chris Markosian, uh, Stephen and, and team, uh, and uh, Renata and Wadi, who are uh, uh, Chris's advisors. And, and um, these are some funding agencies. And thank you again for the invitation to speak. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions in, in the chat or, or otherwise. Thank you very much, Sagar. That's great talk. Uh, so we'll move now to uh, our uh, plan break. And I would ask that uh, you return at uh, 3.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, at which time I will introduce my co-organizer, Dr. Uh, Bala Marugan uh, Desinghu, Bala Desinghu, who is part of the Office of Advanced Research and Advanced Research Computing here uh, at uh, Rutgers. And he'll be leading the tutorials and uh, take us through the hands-on part of this uh, this crash course. This is a this is a new departure for us. The first time we're actually doing um, tutorials as part of the um, uh, crash course, and I'm looking forward very much to uh, uh, being able to do this again uh, as we um, uh, as, as we mount other crash courses in the future. So, please be back at three thirty Eastern, and we will uh, we'll resume with Bala in in the lead. Thank you very much. <laughs>